you get the demo back up. They're excellent at storage. Yeah, all right, we're on this time. Okay, welcome to session three of um, the, our module on uh, containers and algorithms, a bit of the standard library that is often known as the STL, standard template library. Uh, so we're talking all about uh, the containers and algorithms that C++ offers and how great they are. Um, before we get on with that, there are a couple of new faces here. So, hello. Um, so I put this slide up at the beginning of every session. We've got this um, Slack channel. Uh, so Slack's like a chat app, if you don't know, like a sort of group chat thing. Um, and we've got our we've got a channel on there that we we can use and talk to everybody can talk to each other uh, for when we're not here. Um, so we really recommend everyone goes and joins that. So if you go to this URL um, and pop your email address in, and it will send you an email, and you click the link, and I think you have to like register a password. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, you can join via this link. And then you'll join the CPP Lang Slack, uh, and then from there you can see all the hundreds of different rooms, one of which is ours, Ash CPP London Uni. So please go ahead and uh, and do that, and we love to hear from you. <coughs> right, second bit, of, second notice. Um, I mentioned this last week as well, and probably the week before that. Um, there's something running at the moment that's called Advent of Code which uh, is really, really, really good. Um, quite challenging in some ways, but in a, in a good way. Um, it's a set of, of daily challenges, and there's a, you know, there's a backstory involving elves and saving, saving Christmas, and it's all a bit of fun. Um, but you go to uh, adventofcode.com, and they, they give you a new problem every day. Uh, and they've been running from the 1st of December, but you can go back and do all the old problems as well. And in fact, if you're really, really into it, they've got all of 2015, 16, 17 on there as well. So it's loads and loads of problems, and they're, they're really good. Um, it's not C++ specific at all. You can use any language you like. Um, obviously, if you're in this class, it's a good opportunity. Cool. Cool. Yeah, uh, and if you're interested, all my solutions to this. Yeah, I've been a bit busy over the weekend, didn't get to... Uh, Saturdays, but anyway, there we are. Um, so yeah, please, please go and go and do that in the code because it's great. Uh, oh yes, and the other thing is, um, there's a, a leaderboard for because you, you get a couple of stars gives you stars for solving the problems. So two stars available for every day. So there's a leaderboard you can join for all of us, so we can you know you can see how you're getting on compared to. I've got people. four. You've got four stars, but you haven't joined our leaderboard, Tom. Yeah, you didn't. Join I don't know where's the leaderboard. Uh, Ollie will dig up the code I'll and give you the code. Table. You have to go to the leaderboards, then I'll give you the code, Spencer. Okay. Okay. So, having to code, yes, you're all going to have. We're having two weeks off. You're going to have lots of time on your hands. I mean, you know, you're probably off work or whatever. <clears throat> you don't want to spend that with your family. You'd rather spend it in front of your laptop, <laughs> solving problems. <laughs> solving problems. Uh, so, yeah. You think you're joking? Sorry. You think you're joking? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So yes, Advent to Code, do it, it's great. Um, so last week, last week was session two of this, this module. We had a pretty hardcore session, uh, all about iterators. Um, so it was, it was pretty tough going. I scared a lot of people off, I, I think, judging by the uh, crowd this week, a few down. Or maybe it's just because it's before Christmas and it's raining and a bit horrible and people would rather just go home in the warm. But anyway, um, yeah, last week we, we talked about iterators. So today we're going to be I'm going to be doing a bit of revision over about what we went over last week, and then we're going to have go a little bit further. We're going to talk about uh, iterator categories as well today, and then that's sort of the first half, and then the second half we're going to have a bit of fun. It's Christmas. It's our last session before Christmas. Our last session of the year. So we're going to have some Christmas themed fun or C plus plus themed fun. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. You're awake, some of you. All right. So let's go over what we what we were talking about last week. Uh, a bit quicker than we did last week. Uh, but so iterators. Iterators are the glue that bind together the algorithms 
in the, in the standard library and the containers. So the containers are data structures that actually hold the information you're interested in. So a vector, which is a, a contiguous array of values, or a standard list, which is a linked list, or a, uh, an unordered map, which is what most languages call a hash map, <coughs> or a standard map, which is an ordered map. And it's, I mean, there are lots and lots of containers in the, in the, in the standard library, in the STL. And there are lots and lots and lots of algorithms that operate on these containers, operate on the elements of these containers. And the interface between the containers and the algorithms what are called iterators. So containers provide iterators and algorithms consume them, algorithms use them. To show you what this looks like, we've got a vector of five elements, five, four, three, two, one. We call a function called standard begin on our vector, and this returns an iterator to the start of the container. And similarly, there's another function standard end. Again, we pass our vector, and it returns us an iterator to the end of the vector. Can we write this as well? Vec dot begin. You absolutely can write vec dot begin. There's a member function that does the same thing. You can say vec dot begin or vec dot end. Um, the standard begin and standard end handle um, C arrays, so raw language arrays, which you probably shouldn't be using anyway because they're evil in many ways. Um, I'll put this in really just to show you that these uh, free function versions of begin and end exist, and you can use them if you like. Okay. So we get an iterator to start of the container, and iterator to the end of the container. And then we call just an example of an algorithm we call sort. <coughs> and we pass sort a pair of iterators, the first and the last. And then it sorts all the elements in that range. So after this call to sort, our vector will then contain 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because we've sorted the elements. And sorting integers just does what you think it does. It goes from lowest to highest. So what's important to note is there's no one iterator type, no, iterator, no single iterator class or even base class. An iterator is what we call a concept. So anything that does the things that an iterator should do, that, as we say, models the concept, that is an iterator. So this is sort of a slightly sort of hand wavy kind of kind of notion. If you're if you're used to um, Sort of object oriented programming, you might imagine that there's a, an iterator base class, and then this is specialized for various containers. That's not the way it works in the STL. Um, the algorithms are what, what are called uh, generic algorithms. They're function templates that can operate on any sort of iterator that you give them, provided the iterators meet the requirements, you can do the things that we expect an iterator to do. And if they can do those things, then you can use them with the standard algorithms. Including your own definite, your your types. Exactly. So if you want to, if you're you're so inclined, you can write your own container type, and you can provide iterators that match this interface, and then you can use them with the standard algorithms. And on the flip side, you can write new algorithms that operate on any compatible container. So it's this decoupling idea that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. It's a very very powerful idea. <coughs> That is my code, you can take the chair. So, what actually, what's an iterator represent? Well, you can think of it as just an index into some set, into some collection, into some container. So an index would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, up to however many elements there are in that container. And this rate is it's like an index, except that it knows which container it belongs to as well. We've already, we've just seen, iterators are usually used in pairs. 
So almost all the standard library algorithms, they operate on at least one pair of iterators. It's where you can begin at the beginning and keep iterating through the container until you reach the end. A pair of iterators like that, we call it, we say that denotes a range. The first iterator of the pair, so what you get from calling dot begin, for example, that denotes the start of the range. So that standard sort example, we say, okay, we want to sort all the elements, including the first one. What's slightly tricky, at least when you first come across these things, is that the second iterator in the pair points to one place past the last element that you want to operate on. This is what uh, mathematically we call a half-open range. It includes the beginning element, it does not include the end element. And there are, there are reasons for this. It makes uh, various algorithms easier to implement. It allows us to denote um, empty ranges very easily. Um, so this is the, the, the convention, this is how, how the, the standard library algorithms work, that we have these half-open ranges. We include the start, and then up to, but not including the end. So we just saw we can use uh, this function standard begin and pass it a container. Um, for all the standard library containers, we can also say container dot begin. So all the standard containers have a member function called begin that takes no arguments. So if you have a, a standard vector of integers called vec, then calling vec.begin will give you an iterator to the start of that container, to the first element, pointing to the first element of that container. And similarly, we can call dot end. And that will return us an iterator to one place past <coughs> the last element of that container. Which is what we want. That's what we want to pass to the standard algorithms. So again, very important notion to keep in your head that it, uh, ranges, standard library ranges are what we call half open. They include the beginning up to but not including the end. Iterators are value types. I've talked quite a bit about value types in the past when we've been having these sessions. Value types, what I mean by that is they behave more or less like a built-in type like an int. That is, we can copy, we can copy them, and when we make a copy, those copies are independent. Right? If we modify an iterator, that does not affect any copies. We can assign to iterators, we can compare them for equality. Some iterators we can even um, have ordering. We can even say is this iterator less than or greater than another iterator. Not all of them. But all iterators can be compared for equality. Yeah? Can, can iterators only be compared for equality between another iterator or another type as well? Uh, you can compare them for equality with um, another iterator of the same type. So iterators are generally small objects, that is they, they don't occupy a lot of space, so usually the size of one or two pointers. And the assumption is that they, these are cheap to construct, that is it's a, a very fast, constructing an iterator is a very fast operation. Copying an iterator is a fast operation. We say that these, that these things operate in constant time. So for example, with a vector iterator, that's really just a wrapper around a, a single raw pointer. So that's very, very fast to copy. You're pretty much free to copy, free to, to create. So the STL algorithms uh, copy iterators around quite liberally because this is assumed to be a very fast operation. Let's just have a look at another bit of code. So here we create a vector of ints. And we create an iterator 
to the first element of the vector. We call vec.begin. It returns us an iterator that points here. And the actual type of this iterator, well, we don't really care. We just know that it adheres to the, outer, the iterator requirements. So we write it as auto. Because actually, as we'll see in a bit, actually spelling out this name is quite tricky. But if we just use auto, it's all really easy. So we can copy iterators. We can create a second iterator, it2. <coughs> Initialize it as a copy of it1. So it2 now also points here, points to the first element, because iterator 1 points to the first element, we've copied it. So now we've got two iterators, both of which point to the first element of this vector. So it2 now denotes the same position in the same collection. So remember what I said, we can compare two iterators into the same collection anyway. To it, we can compare two iterators into the same collection, we can compare them to equality. We can say, are you pointing to the same element? Do you represent the same position? And because we've created this as a copy, well, we can be pretty confident that this assertion is going to pass. This assertion will pass. Because they're iterators which point into the same collection and they point at the same element, therefore they're going to compare equally. Iterators value types, regular types, so we can assign to them. So now we call vec.end. Vec.end returns us an iterator to one past the end of the collection, so it points to this sort of imaginary location here, after three. Sort of imaginary location. <coughs> Just there. And we take the result of this and we assign that value to it too. So just as, you know, you might say that int i equals three, to create a new int, and then you'd say i equals 49, that's assigning to an int. And here, you're just assigning a value to an iterator. What makes uh, an iterator like a invalidator? We're going to talk about iterator invalidation uh, in a little while, actually. Because there are quite a few things you can do that make an iterator invalid. So we've now changed the value of it too. It still points into the same collection, but it's pointing to a different position. It's no longer point, pointing to position zero. <coughs> Remember, we count from zero in C++. It was pointing to position zero, and then we changed. We, we changed the value of the iterator. We changed what it was pointing to. So it now points to this position here, points to position three, which doesn't exist in the vector. So it's a sort of phantom imaginary past the end position. We've changed the value of this iterator. So the iterators are no longer equal. Now we can assert this is right, iterator 1 is equal to iterator 2. Now, it's an interesting thing to think about is I initialize this vector with three elements. What if I'd default constructed this vector? What if this vector had no elements in it? What would change? What would change on this slide if I just if I removed one, two, and three, and I just not vet begin a vet it one it now equal it two. Yeah. So if the vector had no elements, then vet dot begin would return this, this sort of phantom past the end value. So we could still call vet uh, vet dot begin. That would be okay. But it would point to nothing. It would point to this sort of, as I say, phantom value. And we could still copy it, and that would be fine. And we could still compare for equality. But now we call vec.end. And that would return the same <coughs> phantom past the end elements. So this assignment would, in this case, if the vector had no elements, this assignment here would not change the value of it to Shouldn't that be one before, one, you know, like the, the, the one after? I'm um, not sure what you mean. Okay, because if the end points to one after the end, yes, and beginning, 
obviously was beginning. Mm. So if there is nothing, shouldn't that stay not one after? Okay, so think of it this way. If the vector had nothing in it, then the beginning of that it's returns an iterator to nothing. Yeah. Right? And the end element always returns to an iterator to nothing. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So if the if the vector was empty, then begin and end return you equal iterators. Begin returns end. Begin and end return the same thing. Okay. So if the vector was empty, this last assertion wouldn't pass. So this is a way mm -hmm. that all standard algorithms use. All the standard algorithms, you can, you are allowed to give them an empty range. And the very first thing almost all the algorithms do is to check whether begin, the first uh, iterator you've given them is equal to the second iterator. And if you pass them an empty range, they do nothing because they've got no elements to operate on. So if begin is equal to end, you know the container is empty. It's a way of testing whether a container is empty. You can also, most of them have a dot empty member function you can call, or you can do dot size equals zero, or whatever. But you can also say, does dot begin, vector begin equal dot vector dot end? And that's true if and only if the container is empty. Does that give you the same view as reserve? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. reserve on a vector doesn't create any elements, it doesn't modify, well, it doesn't insert any elements into the container. All it does is say, Oh, like, <clears throat> prepare some space for me to use. Okay. So, iterators are, are value types. We can copy them, assign to them, compare them for quality or inequality. We can also dereference iterators. This is sort of... Uh, Quite confusing language, unfortunately the terminology is a little bit confusing, but uh, it's actually inherited from C, so we'll, we can blame you know, Dennis Ritchie in 1971 for this. Um, if we have an iterator, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, if we have an iterator that points to an element of a container, so if we call dot begin on a non-empty container, then we say that's a valid iterator, and then we can say, okay, you represent a position in a, can, in a container. You're, you are pointing to an element of a container. What is the value of that element you are, you are looking at? What is that value right now? And this operation is called dereferencing. So the reason for this is because iterators are a, a sort of notion of a computer science <coughs> reference. Right? In, in computer, abstract computer science there is this this notion of something called a reference, a reference type. Uh, this is not the same as C++ references. Right? Uh, there's this sort of abstract, abstract computer science notion that they call a reference. A C++ reference is a very much more specific thing. So dereferencing an iterator gets you the thing that the iterator is pointing to, is referring to. <coughs> So to perform this operation, if we've got an iterator named iter, we write star iter. This is the pointer dereference notation from C and C++. So what will happen if we dereference the last, the, the one behind, outside? A pass the end iterator, yeah. that's an error in your program. Will that be like a crash? No. It might crash. So what do you do? If you then should you like as a precaution some kind of sanity check before you dereference the iterator? Um, in general, that's a very hard thing to do. Um, some standard libraries, so the the uh, Microsoft standard library you get if you use um, Visual Studio, Visual C plus plus, they have this uh, notion of debug iterators that do this check for you, mm -hmm. and. Um, other standard libraries, you can use special compile flags that will use debug iterators. And they will pick up these things for you. But the cost of that is that using these iterators is much, much slower than using um, unchecked iterators. <coughs> Why would it crash? Why would it crash? Well, it might not. It doesn't on my... No, uh, no it may not crash. This is the thing. It's what's called undefined behavior. So, well, the, well, is theoretically, you're trying to return an undefined value or something yeah. along those lines. But that's, that's quite tricky. 
you have a fast airplane. But don't worry, it might just explode in the midair. Basically, yeah, but this is. <laughs> but if we're thinking about air, airplane terms, the you know this is not this is not a, a seven four seven passenger jet. It's not even a, a little um, you know a little two seater thing that learners use. This is this is like military hardware. This is this is high grade, <laughs> like super duper fast multi million billion dollar warplane right. technology. This is. So we're flying to Russia to stop the attack, and it exploded in the middle. Of the Only if you push the button, Mark self-destruct. So don't do it. Um, use the algorithms, right? Because the standard algorithms take a lot of care to not run past off the end of a off the end of a row. So it's basically on the developer to keep an eye to make sure that he doesn't. Trip as with that. as with many things in C plus plus. It's a very sharp toolbox, right? You get very sharp knives, so you can do things very efficiently, but, but you can also cut your own fingers off. Right. So imagine the self-destruct <coughs> The self-destruct button is directly next to the autopilot button. Yeah. yeah. Be very careful. Yes. Do they change this to the dinner one? But it's the, it's the same thing, Tom. It's the same thing as if, if you forget about iterators for a moment, if you just imagine uh, indices, in, for a container, uh -huh. right? So if we have a container, that, uh, a vector that has three things in it, uh -huh. what happens if you ask, well, can I have element 52? Yeah, but uh, in the tricky part which I can feel is, let's say, you, let's say you're iterating, uh, you know, you're going through, let's say, a vector, and if I dereference what I'm getting, and if I just go over, then boom. It's well, don't go, don't go over the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it could just trick, trick you over. But obviously, if you say, okay, uh, I've got 10 elements, a vector, and I ask for element 50. But how do you know that, that you can't that's have element my 50? Bad. How do you know that you can't have element 50? Because, well, I don't know. Because I suspect I'm writing the code, so I should know. But with this well, one, it's that's it's... exactly my point. Okay. We never do magic numbers. Yeah. So why is it any more useful? In the previous example, you also IT or IT one and you can spec begin, right? Yeah. Uh, is that any more efficient than saying uh, IT one equals vec bracket zero? Okay, so vec square bracket zero will return you <coughs> the thing at position zero, mm -hmm. right? That will return you a value. Right. An iterator is not a value. An iterator is a thing we can use to look at the values in the container. Right, so um, by using it one, how do we extract the value at uh, zero? You do this. That's the iterator. You dereference the iterator. Got you it. do star Excellent. it, and it will say, "Here is the the value that's that what you're actually looking at, as opposed to just somewhere yeah. there." So iterators <laughs> are like an abstraction of of indices into a container, almost. You can think of. So, yeah. So the value composition of the iterator is. Purely not having to copy the value of the within from the container, it's ref is to know the position that you're trying to point to. So it uses less of as you mentioned it's cheap. So you don't have to be copying and pasting values into different variables. And okay, so I guess a way to think of it is like this. If all you the only container that you ever used uh, were vectors, arrays, strings, contiguous containers then you could use just uh, integer indices, integer values. You could say, instead of it1, you'd say like pos1. You just begin at zero, and you keep iterating until, you, until it was equal to the size of the container, and then you stop. And for contiguous containers, that, that, that is vectors and things like that, those two operations are, are equivalent. Right? They're, they're going to produce exactly the same. Yes. The reason iterators are so powerful is because they allow this same abstraction to be used with, with other types of containers, things like linked lists, things like uh, hash maps, things like uh, sets, things like um, run out of containers, but all the different standard library containers, not only the standard library containers, but other containers other people have written that are compatible with these conventions. Sorry? Trees and graphs as well. Trees and graphs, yeah. It, it can get quite tricky using and trees. Tries. 
tree. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there. Are, so if you go to Boost, uh, Boost for those who don't know, it's a, it's a very well known um, collection of C++ libraries, and they have a, a container library that has lots of very specialized containers for all sorts of things. And they do have a, a graph library, and trees, tries, all sorts of things. So an iterator is, is, is something that, that represents a position in a sequence. We can go and say, OK, what is the value of at this position? We do that. It's an operation called dereferencing the iterator. And we do that by calling, by writing star eta. This is an operator overload for those who were playing along in the last module. We did a bit on operator overloading. This is how this works, by operator overloading. If the thing that we get from here, if star iter gives us something that is const, something that is read-only, then that iterator is what we call a const iterator. Now, is, is that, when you say const, is that the dereference value, or is that the address that's const, or both? What do you mean by address? The memory address. So can you, can you change your pointer? Reassign your point or address. Point. You can. Okay. Uh, so if the thing, if the thing that you get from the referencing, if that is a const value, then it's a const iterator. Okay. We're gonna go. Well, will we? We're gonna go into a bit. I've got a few slides. Another slide on, on const iterators. Might make it clear. We've already mentioned this. This dereferencing operation is only valid. Uh, it's only available, you should only use it on valid iterators. Just as we can't say, if, if you've got a three element vector, you can't say give me the value at position 67, right? Because they just, there isn't anything there. So if we try to form an iterator that points to position 67, and we try to dereference that iterator, that is an error in our program. And if we're lucky, it'll crash. And if we're really unlucky, it'll just return us some random junk memory that's 67 places past the end of or past the start of the array, some random bit of memory, and things will appear to work or might give you strange values, or it's what's called undefined behavior. Pretty much anything can happen. Invalid iterators include the things you get from dot end. Remember, dot end returns you. An iterator that points just off the end of your collection. It doesn't actually point to an element, it points just past the last element. So if you try and dereference end, that is an error in your program. Something's going to go wrong. So again, just to show this off, we've got a vector of three elements. We call dot begin to obtain an iterator to the start of the container. And then we call star it1. That is, we dereference it1. And whatever value this gives us, we pass it to standard out, print it with a new line. So, what is this going to print? It's going to print 1. So it 1, we've initialized it with begin, so it points here. And then when we dereference it, we say, OK, what is the value that you're pointing to? It's going to say, OK, it's 1. So this, this line is going to print 1, followed by a new line. OK, so what does this line do? Exactly what it does. Well done, yes. Um, this says, OK, I want you to dereference this. Give me a reference to the thing that as at, is at position 0. Remember, iterator 1 is still pointing here. So give me a reference to that and change its value to 
be 42. So this doesn't modify the iterator, it modifies the container through, the, through that iterator. So after this line, what is the vector going to contain? 42, 2, and 3. 42, 2, and 3. Absolutely. We've changed the value of the int at position 0. So again, if we print the value at it 1, it's going to print. It's going to print 42. Which for some reason I didn't put in a comment, but there we are. Okay, let's let's ramp things up just a little bit. This time we've got another vector, C vec. And this is a const vector. This is a vector that's read-only. We cannot change, change this vector in any way after it's been initialized. So we initialize it with 3, 2, and 1 this time. But the vector, this variable, is const. It's a read-only variable. So we initialize it to this time to point to the first element of CVEC. So int2 points here. So what does this line do? Yeah. Everybody see why this prints three? Because we uh, D this forms an iterator that points to the beginning of the container to element zero, and then we're dereferencing that iterator to obtain the value at that position. So it prints three. Okay. Sorry? It's an error, isn't it? Preempting my question. Yeah, so, so, so what's going to happen at this line here now? Star it2 equals 42. <laughs> so up here, this dereferenced it1 and it set that value equal to 42. So we've already had the answer. It'll give you a compiler. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to give you a compiler. You're absolutely right. It's an error. This is going to be, the compiler is going to say, you can't do this because what we're trying to do is to modify this container. And we've promised that this container cannot be modified after we've created it, after we've initialized it. So any attempt to modify that container is a compiler, including by dereferencing an iterator and assigning through that iterator. So, so, sorry. So, if we uh, consider a const uh, container next uh, iterator running on it, uh, const. Yes, it does. Yeah. So it too is what we call a const iterator. It's an iterator into a const container. It's one way of thinking about it anyway. It's an iterator which you cannot use to modify values. You can only read via this iterator. You cannot write via this iterator. And a fun fact, if you're actually if you're curious, well, I don't want to blow your mind too much or confuse you, but it one and it two will have different types here. It1 and it2 are no, no longer the same type. Because one is a, what we call a mutable iterator, and the other one is a constant iterator. So the type safety rules in C++ actually um, will come into play here if we, if we try and mess about with these values in incompatible ways. So last little example of this slide. Now I've got it three. Uh, we're, oh, we're back to this first one again. So it's we call it vector end. So vector end returns what? Oh. Sorry. Nothing. 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 It returns an iterator that points to one past the end of the container. So not here, but one past there. It returns an iterator that points to an imaginary sort of 
value that doesn't really exist. It just represents a position of the end. So it's not actually referencing to an actual memory address, no. otherwise it'll cause more than three. Yes. So what happens if I do this now? Let's just get a random number. It'll blow up. It'll blow up. This is, this is undefined behavior. It3 does not point to a valid element in the container. It points to just there, just one off the end. So if we try and dereference it, well, all bets are off. Anything could happen. It's, you know, it might just give us four, which would be the worst possible thing, right? Wouldn't it? That, that, would, that would be really awful. Because um, It might crash. If you run it through some sort, of, some sort of sanitizer, it certainly will crash. It certainly will give you an error. If you run it in debug mode, you might be lucky and it might crash. It might give you four. It might give you four million. It might format your hard drive. It might make demons fly out of your nose, mm -hmm. as they say. That may be better. Demons flying out of your nose. Yes. yes, it might eat all of the cheese in your house. Right? Anything can happen if you do this. Okay. There's a nasal demon talk. That's where that. Yeah, it's a, it's a famous reference to making much. Yeah. Just one question. So, in some implementations, the end points to not not be uh, not not pointer. So, trying to dereference the not pointer is going to be compiled, right? Yes. Oh, uh, not compiler. No, the runtime. Run, run the runtime. Potentially, yeah, might not be. This sort of thing, well, if you're very lucky, you, this might be com catchable at compile time, but in general, <laughs> it isn't. Something that you can catch, that you can catch at compile time. Is it equivalent to a It might do. Um, for vector, it probably doesn't. For something like a list, it might. But the point is, it, it doesn't really matter how this is implemented, because you, you're not allowed to do it. <laughs> <clears throat> this might print junk, it might crash. We don't know. All bets are off. The behavior is undefined. Okay, so things we can do with iterators. We can create them, copy them, assign them, co compare them for quality. We can dereference them if they're valid. Another thing we can do with them, the another, last of the sort of fundamental operations, is incrementing. So if we have an iterator that points to position P, we can increment that iterator so that it points to position P plus 1. And we can write this, we write plus plus iter. So just as with int, with int you say like if you've got int i equals 3, you do plus plus i. That int is now 4. If you've got if iter pointed to position p in a sequence, you do bang. The next position in the sequence. So this is called pre-increment. The plus plus goes before <coughs> the name of the variable. There's also a post-increment operation, which does something very, very similar. It also increments the iterator, but it actually returns you the previous value. Um, this is, can be useful in some circumstances, but in general, this is what you should be writing. Why is there a Because that's what uh, post-increment does on an integer. So, so if you do i, I plus, plus, I mean, like, initializing the variable called i, and i plus plus, plus yeah. that yeah, but you are never using the return value of i plus plus, not in a form anyway. So what would happen if you do plus plus then dereference iter? You can't do that. You could do star plus plus iter. I just did. Okay. Well, yeah, you can't do plus, plus plus star iter. If you were so sorry, if you've got a vector, if you've got a vector of integers, if you do uh -huh. plus plus star iter, uh -huh. think what that's going to do. That's going to dereference the iterator and then Close. increment the thing. Array of floats. Is there a plus plus on floats? If there is, there shouldn't be. Anyway, if you do plus plus star iter, that's uh -huh. going to dereference your iterator and then apply plus plus to whatever you've just got from that dereference operation. Does it change from 0 to 1? That's okay. roughly called this. Can, can you do 
so arithmetic on it is like I was thinking about flattening a 2D array and jumping along columns. Um, some kinds of iterators, and we'll talk about which kinds of iterators you can do that. But incrementing is something you can do with all valid iterators. No, you can't. No. This operation is only only valid, only meaningful on valid iterators. So we can increment until we reach the end, but once we're there, we can't uh, can't increment a point uh, an iterator that points to the end of the sequence. There's also a standard library function, it's called standard next. And you pass it an iterator, and this is kind of useful because it returns you a new iterator. A new iterator, it doesn't modify iter, but it gives you a new iterator that points to the next position. So you say out of, and say new iter equals standard next of brackets old iter, yes. Yeah, it's done a forward. Standard forward? Isn't it forward? No, uh, advance is what I'm thinking of. But advance, advance modifies its argument next, creates a new. To give you a demonstration, this time I've got an array of 12 floats. <laughs> this was Ollie's contribution last week, turns out it wasn't necessary. But... What was that? Oh, uh, yeah, when I wound you up, yeah. <laughs> I think that was after four beers. So. Yeah. So, yeah, rather than a vector, now I've got an array of 12 floats. So we form an iterator to the start of this array, and it one points to the element at position zero. I'll call plus plus it one. So this doesn't modify the container. This changes the iterator so that it points to the next position. So after this line, it one now points to the element at position one. What? Sorry. He's making a joke. Okay. Oh. I hope he's making a joke. It one now after after this. It one now points to the element at position one. We've advanced the iterator. We've incremented the iterator so to move to look at the next element in the sequence. Now I've used this function standard next. I've passed it it one. So <coughs> where does it two point now? The element of position two. Correct. Standard next. You pass it an iterator. It returns you a new iterator. It points to a position one after it one. It1 is not modified. It1 still points to position 1. So a little trickier now, <coughs> perhaps. Here I've got a for loop. A for loop involving iterators. So what does this code do? Yes. So all the array is now turned. So all the values are now maximum. It's absolutely correct. It sets every element of this array equal to 99. So if we remember how our three element for loop works, we first of all create this variable here, initialize it to ar.begin, that is element zero in the array. We check, is it equal to ar.end? If it's not, we execute this code, and then we have this, this post condition plus plus end. So what this will do is initialize it, check whether it's equal to the end. It's not, so okay, we dereference the iterator, we change that value, we assign through that iterator, so this is going to put 99 in position 0. And then it's going to increment the iterator, and it's going to check again. 
Okay, now I've incremented this iterator. Am I now at the end position? No, I'm not. So now I'll dereference it again. But now it points to somewhere different. Now we've done with element one, it's now sorry, with element zero, we're now pointed to element one. So we dereference it again. We obtain the value of position one and we set that equal to 99. And it's going to repeat this process and repeat this process until eventually, when we're at position 11, remember we count from zero, we increment the iterator one more time and we reach the end. And at that point, it is going to be equal to array.end. We've reached this phantom position. And at that point, the loop terminates. So this is, or used to be anyway, a really, really common pattern, really, uh, something you'd see lots and lots in every single code base. Um, in C++11, they introduced a range for loop, which is shorthand for doing, it literally does pretty much exactly this. It's laid out very slightly differently, but it does basically exactly this. Okay, so 51 minutes of me chatting. And that was what we covered last week. So now we're going to do some new <coughs> stuff. <coughs> Any questions about last week's dereferencing and incrementing iterators? I still don't get the plus plus before and plus plus minus thing. Why, why the plus plus after returns a value, returns a value before? Okay, so um, both pre-increment and post-increment, they do the same thing in that they both increment the thing that you get. Yeah. Right? But they have a return value. That is, you can say, is plus plus, well, don't think about iterators for me, think about it. Okay, is, if you've got int i equals zero, int, int i equals zero, you can say, is plus plus i equal to one? And that's going to be true. Right? But if you're int i equals 0, then i plus plus is going to increment i, but it's going to return you the old value, so it's going to return 0. Right? Uh, and that's uh, that's from c, that's the way c behaves, pre-increment versus post-increment. So if you did plus plus i, that would invert for plus i plus plus would... No, the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And iterators just <coughs> try to do exactly the same thing. So in this, this syntax that was inherited from C. Isn't it if in doubt use plus plus i? Or almost always use uh, the pre-increment plus plus i, unless you really know what you're doing. It's more efficient. So range for loops, I just mentioned it. Any type which meets the standard library's container requirements can be used in a range for loop. So when I first introduced range for loop back in like week three or something, I said that there was this thing that I called it, at the time the container protocol, and anything that met this this protocol uh, could be used in a range for loop. Protocol is not really the terminology we use in C plus We take we call it a concept. Anything that matches the container concept requirements can be used in a range for loop. And the container requirements are pretty simple. They are something that have valid begin and end fun length functions, or free functions even, which return an iterator. So this means all of the standard library containers, and all the containers anybody else has written that use, that can have begin and end functions that return valid iterators. So if we have such a container, like a vector, we can use this nice shorthand and say for every int i in our vector, I'm going to print the value. So this does exactly the same, or does the exactly the same kind of iteration that we saw on the previous slide. Behind the scenes, this is doing like auto it equals vector begin. This is just really handy shorthand for iterating over every element of the container. This is, this is really, really useful. 
saves us having to do all that horrible three element for loop stuff that we, we saw in the last slide. I'll let you take the notes. Iterator types. Now, I've already said there isn't one type that is C++ type. There is no one type that is an iterator type. Iterator is a concept. Anything that meets the requirements, any type for which we have all these overloaded operators that do the expected thing, anything, any type that is written, that we've written, that matches these requirements, that is an iterator. It's what's called duck typing. It looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck and it Swims like a duck. It's a duck. Don't tell me that geese also swim like that. I don't want to hear it. But the actual type, the actual C++ type of an iterator depends upon the implementation of the container and in general a vector iterate, well not in general, it will be, the type of iterator you'll get from a vector is different from a list iterator, which is different to an unordered map iterator, which is different to a set iterator, and so on and so on. These are different C++ types. Which actually is a handy byproduct, means it's impossible to accidentally try and assign one to the other. You can't accidentally you know, compare a list iterator with a vector iterator. That's going to give you a compiler. So all those examples that you've just seen, I used auto to deduce the type. And the reason for that is because these, the actual names of these types are going to be some implementation specific thing that you can't, that, that, that depend on your standard library implementation and you can't know. But if you really want to find out, there is a type alias. Within each container, there is an alias available to its iterator type. And if you really have to do it, you can spell it like this. So this, we've got a vector of five elements here, a vector of ints. So this says, find me this type, find me the iterator type for a vector of integers. And I don't actually think the type name keyword is necessary there. Um, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, and it's confusing as to when it is and isn't. Um, but you can see that this is, this is horrible. And actually before C++11, this is what we had to do all the time. And it was, it was awful. Um, so with C++11, we don't have to bother. We can just use the auto keyword in here, and it will deduce the type to be exactly, to be exactly the right thing. So if for some reason you're looking at, at very old code, pre-C++11 code, you'll probably see it littered with things that look like this. And it's, it's, ugh, it's horrible. It's essentially the, the same type name as what the original thing was, but with colon, colon, iterator. Exactly, yes. Yes. You, you can't you can't print it out. Do you mean without putting a I'm just trying to do a C out iter. It's not spent in the No, because it needs to be No, but it probably says something horrible like standard yeah. colon colon vector iterator brackets in or something. <coughs> yeah. The rest. So yeah, if you really need to find out what the type is, you can say this, but you almost never need to do that in this case. So that's great. Const iterators. We've already mentioned const iterators. We'll go to, just to go over it again. An iterator which only provides us with read-only access to a container. That's a const iterator. 
So just to be a little bit confusing, you can have an iterator, because an iterator is just a value. You can create a const instance of an iterator, and in that case you can't modify the iterator, that is you can't increment the iterator to point to something else. That's an iterator which is const. Which is not the same thing as a const iterator. A const iterator is an iterator through which we cannot modify the container. It, read, it only provides us read-only access to the container's elements. So we've already seen, if we have a const instance of a container, then when we call begin and end, it's going to return us const iterators. We saw this before, a few slides ago. However, it may be that we have a mutable container. There's a container, a non-const instance of a container, read-write container. But for, what, for whatever reason, we're doing, a, we're doing an operation on it that only requires read-only access. Let's say we just want to <coughs> count how many elements are equal to three. Right, that's an operation which doesn't need to modify the container. So we can obtain, even though it's a, a mutable container, we can obtain const iterators by using these cbegin and cend member functions. So rather than calling .begin, we call .cbegin. And that returns us a const iterator, even when we call it on a mutable container. So it's sort of as a safety thing. Right? You can, if you're using an operation which you don't want to modify the container, if you use cbegin and cend, then you know that you can never modify the container via that iterator. And yes, there are standalone standard cbegin and standard cend as well, if you, if you want to use those. Is it good practice to use that generally? Yes. Um, and in general, and I mentioned this before as well, a const iterator type is not the same as an iterator. It's not the same as the same type as that container's iterator type. They're different C++ types. But they are compatible in limited ways. That is, we can always convert an iterator to be Read only. We've got to. Sorry, yes. So we can always iterate, and also, we can always go from. Um, read write to read only. We can always go more restricted, and we can't get less restricted. Exactly that, yes. Yes, perfect. So we can compare a const iterator and a non const iterator and say, do you point to the same element? But we can't assign from a const iterator to a non-const iterator, because that would be loosening the requirements, weakening the requirements. But we can do it the other way around. <coughs> so const iterator A, we can set that equal to a mutable iterator. And the const iterator means that the, this is, again, something that throws people. And I didn't really have a good way of summing this up in one sentence. But a const iterator means that we cannot modify the container via that iterator. The element pointed to is treated as const, if you think about it. It doesn't mean the iterator itself is not modifiable. We can modify the iterator itself, we can increment it. So you can point to a different location. You can point to a different location, yes. But we cannot change the element, cannot change the container via that. But you can't, you wouldn't be able to change any elements at the point to be changed. Correct. Is that the same, so does the same logic that's applied to const auto when, when you uh, return, let's say if you, there's a function returning a pointer, yeah. and you create a new pointer which is a const auto pointer, it is actually, the pointer itself is const, not the value which It is identical to the way it works for pointers because a pointer, a C pointer, is a kind of iterator. What he's saying is a const auto point. No, a const auto pointer means it's a pointer to whatever type it produces, and that type is const. It's, no. the pointer is const. Left hand, the pointer is const, and the type is const. The right hand. If you, if you restrict a const auto pointer, it will fail to assign if the type on the right hand side is not also const. Uh, no, of course, it will assign if it's auto const. The type itself has to be const, not the pointer value. It's not const star const. No, const star is right in this. 
the pointer is no, const. Const auto star const would be a const type const pointer. Okay. Iterator and validation, this is the scariest bit of everything that I'm talking about today. This is really scary. Iterator and validation. This is dangerous and worrying. It's something you have to be careful of. Yeah. Well, not black magic. The rules are all there. You just have to be aware of what the rules are. Same from black magic. Uh, and the, the, the text is about to get very small, so you know it's dangerous. We hold an iterator to a container. So we have we've got an element, we've got a vector of five elements, non const vector of five elements. And we have an iterator that points to element number three. Right? Points to the middle of our container. And then we call vec.clear. What dot .clear does is it empties the container, removes all the elements. Well, our iterator still points to position 3. And position 3 doesn't exist anymore. So our iterator that was valid has been become invalidated by an, oper an operation we did on the container. The data structure has changed from underneath us. And it has invalidated our iterator. Do you need a destructor then? Oh. Sorry. Do you need to take care of that this time? Uh, Do you need to clear up your iterators if you change? Well, you can just let the iterator die. Right? You can just. Oh, okay. <coughs> so we call this a dangling iterator. Because it was pointing to something valid and then the container changed and now it's not pointing to anything anymore. It's invalidated. These are dangling iterators, and they're a very frequent source of bugs. This is the same problem that we have with dangling. It's exactly the same problem we have with dangling pointers. You know, pointed to a bit of memory. Whatever was at that, that memory address has ceased to exist. We're still looking at that memory address, though. But if we try, I'm sorry, if we try and examine what's at that memory address, it's not there anymore. That's a dangling pointer. That's that's a bug in our program. And this is exactly the same problem. Yeah. So this is an example where this all. Iterators in a different scope and it's pointing to another memory address which originally was going to a valid container. Yeah, that, that could that could happen. So the iterators should all be always be in the scope inside the data structure and definition. Iterators should never outlive the container that they point into. So define define your data structure and then generate your yeah. iterators inside the curly yes, brackets inside. Yes. So, if this has happened, what are the options we've got? If our iterator has been invalidated, what can we do with it? Well, there are only two things we can do with it. One is either just to let it die, stop using it effectively, and wait till the end of the scope when it gets, dis when it gets destroyed. And the other thing is we can reassign it, we can reinitialize it, we can assign to it, we can assign a new valid value to that. And reinitialize it. So again, if you're if you're comfortable using C pointers, these are exact. This is exactly the same thing that happens when you get pointer validation. The only thing you can do with an with a if you just use the the, the, the equal assignment, wouldn't that wouldn't do the trick? Yes, one? that's exactly what I mean by assignment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you do a point that uh, iterator uh, equals nothing? Construct. Is that valid in any way? Um, like pointer. You okay. could you could set it equal to a default constructed iterator uh, if your iterator type happens to be default constructible. And no, not all of them are. Some of them are. Consignment or not? Sorry. Consignment or not? Um, <laughs> there may not be a. a well, okay. I don't know this. Iterator. For all the standard containers, you can set it equal to a default constructed iterator, and that will. Do what you think, and then we'll nullify it. Okay. But we still can't dereference and nullify an iterator because it's not pointing to anything. So we still can't dereference it. We can't increment it. So we can't do anything with it other than let it die. How are we aware when our, our pointer was at school? 
This is a common error. Then everyone, it's not like everyone really knows. Who this is this is this is a serious problem. This is this is hard in general. So something as simple as doing pushback on a vector. When we call pushback on a vector, we insert new values into the end of the container, and at some point we're going to run out of space in the vector. And behind the scenes, what it does is it goes and it allocates some new memory. So it says to the operator system, please turn out some more memory. And we get a new, larger, bigger array, a lot more space, twice as much space as we had before, usually. And it moves all the elements that it had, its old storage, moves it into the new storage, and deletes the old storage. Hands that memory back to the OS. Yes? So a vector inference is actually pointless rather than inverse. They are implemented as pointers. No. Um, often wrapped around, wrapped in some, um, it's not literally a T star, but it is implemented as that. No, vector iterators are, are yes, very cheap, like pointers. Um, so eventually when we call pushback, if we do it often enough, we're going to run out of space, and all our elements are going to get moved into this new storage, and the old storage is going to get deleted. And we can't, well, in general, unless we've, we've manually controlled the space by using dot reserve and shrink to fit and these things, in general, if, we, if we're just pushing back on a container that we haven't very, very carefully uh, managed, we don't know whether pushback is going to cause a reallocation or not. But if pushback reallocates, it invalidates all existing iterators. Because they're now pointing to somewhere that's just that storage is gone. So in general, I say, unless you're very, very carefully managing these things, in general, you have to assume the pushback, if you call pushback on a container on a vector, that is iterate that is invalidated every iterator you hold into that container. Yes. I thought the iterator was pointing to a specific container itself rather than an actual memory address. Basically no. Uh, no, <laughs> that's a short way of putting it. What about using push from when things like it's assert? It depends on the container. So, um, the standard library, um, you know, if you don't do it, but if you go and read the, the, all the standard E's, it goes into incredibly de great detail about which member functions invalidate iterators and which do not. Right? Uh, don't read the standard, go and read CPP reference because that's still pretty hardcore, but a lot less hardcore than the actual like ISO thousand page document. Right? Um, and it goes into great detail about which functions are safe to call, which functions you can call which will not invalidate iterators. And it depends on the container. So for example, you can call pushback on a linked list because the way a linked list is implemented, that doesn't invalidate any yeah. other containers. Pushback on a vector, may invalidate your iterators. Pushback on a list is guaranteed not to invalidate your iterators. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, and yes, in general, the only way of knowing whether you're going to invalidate your iterators by calling a member function is to go and look up the documentation for that member function and see what it does. But there is this nice catch-all thing that a const member function, that is, a member function that you can call on a const instance of a container, that is guaranteed never to never to invalidate iterators. Because it can't, because it can't, a const member function cannot, it cannot modify the container. Right? So it can't invalidate any iterators if it doesn't modify the container. So what you're really getting to is <coughs> don't ever use iterators to modify the container. You can modify the elements of the container yeah. just fine. Yeah. But be very, very careful if you um, inter intermix those with um, adding things to the container. But if you reserve, before, if you if you, you know if you're absolutely sure you never overrun your, your reservation, yes, then then you won't invalidate your iterators. If size is less than capacity, what? if size is less than capacity, yeah, I'm thinking of small stuff like chessboards. Well, no, for size being the number of elements. Sure. Well, for a chessboard, you've only got 64 spots, so you might want to use a standard array in that case. Um, yes, this in the iterator invalidation is kind of scary, 
and kind of bites you in, in funny ways. Um, and it's something to be aware of, that modifying the container whilst you're iterating over it is in general a bad idea. Uh, oh, you were stretching. Because what helped? Have you ever done this and been searching? Where the hell is my code not working? Um, and they do that up for it. Yeah, that works. Very occasionally. If so, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, occasionally. Occasionally. It's something that the more you do it, the more you, you sort of, you recognise the danger signs, right? And then maybe you go and look at it through a debugger or you go and use a... a, a Sanitize or stack and analyze or something like that. So, would you think to yourself sometimes, okay, maybe I won't use a list, I'll use a list? <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, although a, a standard list is rarely the right answer to any question. Because uh, <laughs> linked lists are, in general, very, very slow things to use. Um, but inserting into the middle of a linked list <clears> is very fast. But anyway. So, don't put stuff onto the front of vectors. That's the other thing. Yes. Yeah, you can use a, a deck, DEQE. Double-ended Q, if that's something you want to do. Right. Um, that's, well, I did have some more to talk about, which was uh, iterated categories. But you know what? It's 10 past 8, 13 minutes past 8, in fact. And it's Christmas, and this is our last session of the year. Let's see. Okay. You're not having a lesson next week? Mm, well, <laughs> yes, no, we, yeah, we absolutely are. Yeah, just just come here. <laughs> come here at half past six. Yeah. It's party time. This is a C plus plus London Uni Christmas party. <laughs> we got crisps. We got actually nobody's got a beer. We've only only got empty coffee cups. But anyway, you can. Can, uh, okay. But anyway, at this point, some... we are done learning about iterators. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, shucks! Ah, oh, shucks! Exactly. And we will reconvene next year when you've all forgotten everything that I said today, and we'll start talking about algorithms themselves, and we'll start talking about containers, um, and we'll have some fun doing that. But in the meantime, I'm going to, well, I'm going to wrap up the video and then I'm going to hand over to Oliver and we'll play a game. But if anybody, now would be a good time, if you fancy going to get a refreshment, please go do, go and do so. I vote for the refreshments because I have to sort out the game to Tom. Uh... I apologise, I completely blanked out. I got this, but I, my job was to get snakes and ladders.